The development of a central sensitized state is really after that first stimulus, when the stimulus of pain is prolonged for X amount of time, it's not a defined amount of time, the nervous system is wound up and it stays wound up over time. And so what ends up happening is um, the nerves change and they become used to being in this hyperactive inflammatory state and the signals change and the, all of the different transmitters change. And so your body, basically the nervous system sort of rewires. And so your body is now on and your pain signals are on even after the pain stimulus has long been gone. Um, and so it can be hard to set them back or to rewire them without a lot of work from a lot of different type of modalities. Um, and that often for patients can be very frustrating because they don't, and for providers, because they don't see, the provider doesn't see the lesion, but the patient's experiencing the pain. Um, so that can be hard to explain to patients. I think it's very difficult to explain because for years we've been looking for a biomedical reason to have pain. This is a bit different because you're going to do imaging and you're not going to be able to find anything wrong with the patient so the patient is feeling like you're biased against them and they become very fearful of the pain. So a lot of people that maybe can't cope with pain, have poor coping skills, or do something called catastrophizing where everything seems to be a catastrophe from their pain, often can develop this sensitized state. And so one of the ways that you can deal with this, Tanya said a little bit about multimodal therapy. So that's looking at different types of therapy, not only pharmacologic, but maybe some type of interventional therapy or maybe some type of cognitive or acceptance therapy in order to be able to understand the pain. These patients often are really fearful of it. So there's actually guidelines for central sensitization and teaching patients about their pain. And once you teach them, it's not the original injury anymore, it's your pain system that's broken, that's sensitized, that's very like hyper, al hyper algesic. You um, get their acceptance from the pain and often their pain can get better. So as far as opioid tapering goes, um, successful strategies can be all different kinds, but um, in my opinion, the most important thing is the buy-in from the patient and explaining to the patient that this is what we're doing and why and what we hope to achieve and what our goals are and establishing that open communication because they need to know that as they go through this process, you're there with them and you're going to support them and provide them with the therapies they need to get through some of the symptoms, et cetera. What are, why are we doing the opioid tapering? It's important to understand why something is happening. So the more knowledge and empowerment you can give to the patient to feel like they're on the team is really, really critical. So that to me is one of the key elements of tapering. And then it's understanding the pharmacology of which drug you're working with and making sure you're tapering the drug based on the pharmacology of that drug. So a short acting versus a long acting versus a patch, how quickly they wear off, how long you should wait between doses. Um, when you get to the lower doses that it takes a bit slower steps than at the higher doses um, to help the receptors kind of get used to being off the drug. I think also <clears throat> the length of time they've been on the therapy. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if someone's just been on it for a short period of time, you may be able to taper that more rapidly. So you may be able to do 25% every two to three days versus someone who's been on it for 10 years. That is gonna take a slower taper. So you're gonna to need to be able to work with your patient, make sure that you're monitoring for side effects and treating those side effects that you may see. And in addition, we also may have to do a rapid taper. So if someone's also using substances inappropriately, we're not gonna continue and do a slow taper for them. That's when we're gonna be doing a very quick taper but managing all their symptoms of withdrawal with other medications and other modalities. It's important to have modalities to treat their pain, but also things like um, clonidine for the sympathetic symptoms or um, something like compazine to, or prochlorperazine to help manage the nausea and vomiting. Um, so knowing about the, all the, the other things and knowing to avoid benzodiazepines because patients may become anxious or may have trouble sleeping. So the last thing you wanna do is start another 
you know, addictive agent in the setting of trying to get people off of opioids. So knowing to use something like trazodone or, or working a lot with your non-pharmacological agents uh, and modalities to try and, and get someone good symptom control is really critical in that period. And I do think um, it's really important for the patient to know what the possible symptoms are and that you're there to support them because the worst thing is experiencing a severe symptom and not having anyone to go to or not having anything to use to get relief from that symptom, then you're not going to buy into that taper anymore and you're not going to want to keep doing it and you're going to say this isn't working. So having all of those tools set up is really important as well. So kind of laying it out ahead of time and making sure the patient knows you can have clonidine if you start getting really tachycardic or start you know having really bad symptoms or if you become... Um, nauseous, we'll treat it, or if you get diarrhea, we'll treat it with this, and so that they know what the kind of the plan is. I agree with Tanya. So, you know, I think patient expectations are huge, but I think practitioners also need to know how to use these alternative medications and not just turn to opioids for pain. So I think by setting up those expectations, we're gonna taper down your opioid, we're gonna use this in place that may not work right away, but you will be able to get some symptom control from this and then utilizing all, all those different non-pharmacologic modalities, cognitive therapy, acceptance therapy, meditation, to try to allow that patient to cope with their pain in addition to providing some pain relief with the adjunctive medications.